I heard Sid, uh, she goes by Sid, so I heard Sid speak a little while ago, and I was just fascinated by her message. And so when I partnered up with uh, Clint Betts and the Silicon Slopes group, and, uh, and, and we talked about the lineup, and, and Sid was like one of the first ones he mentioned. He says, oh, you gotta, we've got to have her on the lineup because she does such a fantastic job. And then you look at her resume, and you look where she's come from and what she's done. We are truly honored to have Sid here uh, uh, just to speak to us today because one of the key most important aspects of entrepreneurship and developing uh, your product and your service is the product development. And she is like the foremost expert in innovation and product development. And if you read through her bio and just kind of see some of the things that she's done, she's had, she's, she herself has developed numerous products that are used all around the world in retail, in Microsoft, in Warner Brothers, Toys R Us. Uh, she spent four years at Disney in the Imagineering uh, area. She, I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit about that. But Disney is known for their creativity and their imagination and their ability to develop products. Uh, she's also on, you know, faculty member at Goldman Sachs 10K businesses or 10K small business program. And probably her most, her most recent one is the Women's Tech Council that she founded and is the president of to try to help develop the technology skills and those aspects in, in women. So we are delighted to have uh, Sid Tetro here to speak with us. So Sid, take it away. I will put a plug in for Roots Tech next week. So the Innovation Day is actually on Wednesday um, and they have a pitch competition that afternoon where I can't remember how much they give away. Does anyone remember? It's a significant amount of money um, to some companies. The cool thing about Innovation Day too is they don't just focus on, um, I mean it's all, not just the genealogy products, it's kind of all things surrounding that. So if you get an opportunity to go, they, it's, a, um, it's a great opportunity. And I'm super happy to be here. As mentioned, I've kind of spent my whole career talking about, thinking about how do you build products that people actually want and will use, because um, I think it's a really interesting challenge. So how many people in here have actually tried to build, a, have built products and taken them to market? How many of you thought about an idea you wanted to take to market? Okay, yeah, I mean, we, you know, every day, I even my, little, my daughter, she's eight, um, the other day we were talking, she's like, Mom, I have these three ideas. I think I should take them to market. Like, you just think about, you know, your natural course, you come up with these ideas, and there's always this really great challenge, which is, how do you actually get them to market, and are they good enough ideas? So I thought I'd share with you a little bit about some of the interesting opportunities I've had, and then give for you kind of some of the core things I think about in developing products. Um, for the last three and a half years, I built a company in the 3D printing space. And um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. I sold it about a year ago, and I recently stepped away from that, so I'm kind of without um, you know, a company at the moment, although I get to work on a lot of really cool projects across the country right now on same thing, product innovation. So I'm gonna give you uh, just a few highlights, I'll switch the uh, monitor over, about what I've been working on and um, kind of talk to you about my philosophy around this idea of customer first. Um, these are some of my alter egos. So my 3D printing business, we decided to build personalized merchandise, to use 3D printing to literally allow you to become Iron Man. That was, we wanted, we wanted to allow you to become whomever your favorite character was and to actually put you in that story. So we ended up partnering with Marvel and Star Wars and a bunch of other companies I'll tell you about to actually create a product that takes your face, a high resolution 3D scan of your face, from a fully connected digital experience and actually t translates that all the way into a physical 3D printed product, which was um, a really, really cool thing to do. We got to work with, um, I threw up some of them here, all of the um, biggest brands and companies basically in the world to take that to market, um, especially as 3D printing was becoming one of the really new things. So we got to work with Marvel. We did deal, a deal with Marvel and Star Wars, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, the NFL, Warner Brothers, including the Harry Potter property, Assassin's Creed, Halo, and then we had an opportunity to work with all the big channels. So we actually took product into Toys R Us and Walmart and, um, Wal let's see, Target, Sam's Club, Costco, you name one of those big brands, we had an opportunity to take product into them, including doing really cool things, um, and I was just going to show you some of those. So we took full-blown experiences across the board into things. And what we, the way I, we nailed all those deals, which I'll tell you a little bit about, um, was actually because we understood product development and what customers wanted and how to sell it from that customer-first perspective. 
which was really compelling. Last year, we actually did the Super Bowl, which happens to be on Sunday this year, but last year we were in San Francisco, um, and we had a full experience that let you become a player from your favorite team. So the way this process worked was still full 3D scan, but you choose your jersey, your name, your number, has the Super Bowl 50 logo on it, and it became your memorabilia of that. And over the years, th over the um, years that we had deployed this, we figured out how to get 90% of the people who came through the experience to buy a product at $150, right? Like, so last year we did the World Series, we did the All-Star Games, and I, and I know if I followed our process that we had tested and refined, that we could get 95 to 100% of those people to spend $125 to $150, which is really amazing, right? When you think of conversion rates and actually how you acquire customers, um, it comes down to both understanding channels and customers and product and being able to deliver through a full stream of those. So we got to do a bunch of really cool things um, through the company. We went to the World Series games over the last couple of years, went to all the baseball all-star games. We did the NFL. We were in Yankee Stadium. Um, before Toys R Us and FAO Schwartz closed in Times Square, we got to do those. We did Comic-Con um, in San Diego. You name those things, right? And it was a really fun experience. It's not very often <laughs> that a really tiny startup company gets to work with all the biggest brands in the world. And we got that opportunity because we were right in the intersection of new product innovation and creating a compelling opportunity. Right? We got to ride the tide of what was happening in 3D printing, which was really, really um, interesting and really fun. So just as a couple of other samples. And for us, we actually created both a physical experience. Oh, sorry, I'm going to back up one. Um, a physical experience and a digital experience. So it kind of went end to end. We figured out how to do acquisition all the way from being in venue to if you're on a mobile platform to if you are on the web. And it required us to um, it, you know, work and navigate a lot of really interesting deals. My deal that I did with Target required 40 people to buy off on that product line. It took me eight months and 40 people, and every day there was a new risk that someone was going to introduce that might kill the deal um, that we had to navigate through and that we had to work through. But we, we became really good at that. One of the other things that I'm not going to talk a lot about today, but that really helped accelerate our company was our ability to build really great networks, especially from when I was very first in college all the way through all of my career, like building relationships with people and being able to you know, have people recognize that you could add talent and that you could work with them became really important to me. So when I wanted the sports guys, I hadn't actually done any work in the sports arena before, but I knew when, when we launched the product that I wanted the NFL, the Major League Baseball, and Major League Soccer. And I had, I had worked in one sports startup before this. We had built a, a mobile app that allowed you to order food from your phone and have it delivered to your seat in venues. So I had a couple of really good friends in the sports side. And um, I called up my friend Nate, and I said, Nate, I don't know anyone in any of these companies, but I know you know them all. Will you go intro me into the guys at the NFL, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, and, let me get those, and help me get those deals? And he did. I made the one phone call. He went in on every first meeting, and we closed all of the deals. But we closed the deals because we understood the formula that it takes to build successful products. Lots of people build products from technology or from functional designs. That's not how people buy, right? And in a world today where it's mobile first um, and you have zero attention of anyone, I mean the average person only looks at seven mobile apps a day, and the average person gives you, they give you today less than three seconds to decide if they will engage with you. You have three seconds, less than three seconds to decide if you're worthy of someone's time before they go somewhere else. That's nothing, right? And so in order to create compelling opportunities that people will use, you have to understand those cycles of adoption because they become really critical to success. So I thought today in our discussion, it might be really interesting to talk about some of the things I've learned around taking products to market and the things that you get a focus on and that really drive compelling adoption and usage. Because there's millions of things that people talk about, but I believe there's some things that are core. And for me, they're, they're proven time and time again I'm working with one of the Fortune 12 companies right now in, a, in an innovation capacity, helping them actually build these same things. And I'm still surprised that it, when I walk in those conversations, that when I think about talking customer first, it's a new idea for them, that they haven't really grounded all of their ideas in customer first. And so I want to talk to you through this process that I think about, and maybe it will help you on your um, journey to, to adventureship, entrepreneurship, I should say. Okay, how many of you have been to Disneyland? And how many of you have been to World of Color? Okay, so what is World of Color? 
It's a nighttime spectacular. I call it the Bellagio on steroids. <laughs> but you know, because you've got some water and some fire and some lasers, and it uses all it uses the water as the projection screen for the movies. And so when I was at Disney, I had an opportunity to work in a capacity in Disney research. So Disney has a research arm. And in that research arm, there's labs all over the world. There's one tied to Carnegie Mellon, one tied to MIT and Harvard, and one tied to ETH in Switzerland. And they're really brilliant academics solving very hard problems that will impact the Disney company. Because remember, the Disney company includes not just themed parks, but studios. It includes consumer products, ESPN, ABC. But they have a huge arsenal of um, properties. And so they have a lot of problems to solve, from computer vision to robotics to big data to 3D modeling. And so they spend a lot of time with really brilliant people trying to solve those. And so I had the opportunity to go in and figure out which of those technologies we could make businesses out of, which ones we could get funded, and then to actually help get them to market. And as I was going through that journey, one of the things I learned, uh, more so than I would say I even knew before, was this idea that it all starts with a story. Right? So what Disney is really brilliant at, and there's lots of research out there and studies about this, is they think about the guest first. They think about how they can create compelling experiences for those people, no matter what their touch point is, because they recognize if they develop from that perspective, they can transform behavior, and they can transform relationships that they have with customers. Um, as, you know, as an example, so this we launched um, these lovely Mickey ear hats at, they got launched at the opening of Cars Land. So there was this idea seven months earlier mm -hmm. that said, you know, when someone goes to the nighttime spectacular, they're just an observer. They're not actually an active participant. So if you think about going to theme parks, which a lot of you have done, when you go to the theme park and you go on a ride, what do you do? What happens to you? You experience it, right? Like you step into a storyline. Radiator Springs is one of my favorite stories. Right? When you step into that Cars Land ride, you're completely taken into a whole other world. Right? And it looks exactly like the movie set. But now all of a sudden you're a member of a storyline, right? And you're this participant where it doesn't just about a ride, right? It's about a fully immersive story, right? And it's based on all of these principles that they believe in true storytelling. So someone had this idea um, as we were sitting at Disney and said, well, the nighttime spectaculars, everyone just watches. How do you actually think about making them part of the show and bringing them into the story? And so there was a product that came out of that, which basically now across every park in the country um, is deployed a technology that has a programmable LED technology that integrates with the show control systems. So if you wear something that lights up, you actually can become part of the show. Um, they're now called Made with Magic, right? And when you wear these, even if you just walk down Main Street in the park when they're at nighttime when there is <laughs> nothing else going on, it actually sinks into different lands. If you and I stand by each other, they can talk peer to peer. There's all these really cool things that happen. Um, I had an opportunity to take them on the cruise ships. So you're at sea, and all of a sudden, there's 3,000 people on the Disney cruise who all have light up ear hats, who are now part of a nighttime spectacular where fireworks are going off and there's a show. It's pretty powerful. The night that I remember standing on the bridge the night that it opened at um, Cars Land, and I was, there was a big press night. There were 3,000 people there. And so the whole world, like the whole stage in front of you, now lights up with these active participants. And for people who were there, you could feel the emotion of the moment where now all of a sudden you became part of story. Because at the end of the day, people react to storytelling, right? They want to become part of a story. The reason Under Armour throws the Spider-Man or the Iron Man logo on a shirt is because people want to become like their favorite heroes. They want to become part of stories. And so whether you're building consumer or business applications, the thing that you have to recognize is what is the thing that draws someone into the story and the reason they want to participate. Because when you understand that emotional connection, you can build product that people will want and that they will use. In our um, 3D printing company, uh, oh, no. sorry, I'm going to pause that one for a sec. In our 3D printing company, the um, so think about it. I'm this really tiny company. I have a, an interesting idea. Got some smart guys on our team. And I'm going to go pitch Marvel on letting me take a product to market <laughs> that has really no market proof, right? Like lots of people haven't done this at scale before. 3D printing is really new. And I was up against pitching other 3D printing companies, right? So there's big companies, have a lot more money than I did. Um, who wanted to go in and actually also get all of these deals. Every, at the time we started the company, 
Everyone wanted the license, everyone wanted those deals with every one of those big partners. That was the thing that was on the table. And so I had an opportunity to go in and pitch, and I pitched directly against a lot of those big players. But they pitched technology, and I pitched a transformative guest experience that said, I can take your brand, where everyone wants to become Iron Man, or become Captain America, or become a player for their favorite baseball team, and I can help those fans become part of a storyline, which in turn builds a connected relationship with you longer than just one moment. And by doing so, right, we instill in them that, yep, I'm a Yankees fan, or I'm a Red Sox fan, or the fact that the Cubs just won, all of a sudden I have something in a product form that took me farther. And it allowed us to close every deal. That we didn't lose any deal that we pitched our story-driven focus from the customer perspective to anyone else. Because we understood that we weren't selling technology. 3D printing happened to enable our product, but it is not what I sold. And I believe that that is the most important thing about developing products and technology, is that you are not selling technology. That you are selling an experience and you are selling something with a compelling value that people want and that they can emotionally connect to. That is the most important thing you did. And I have had lots of fun experiences to do. I threw a couple of other videos in here um, of stuff we've built over the time. So we built a, I had a, I've had an opportunity to work on a bunch of really fun apps. Uh, but even when you tell stories like this, right, you're telling it not from the fact of like, let me just tell you why we can deliver food to your seat, right? You're telling it from this perspective of a story that emotionally connects with someone that drives behavior, right? And that becomes a really critical factor in building successful products. Um, and I actually sometimes talk about it as you have to also know your customer. I'm not spending a lot of time talking today about knowing your customer, but it is a really big part of the customer development cycle. If you are not grounded in who your customer is, it is near impossible to build a product that will get mass adoption. Lots of, so I was working the weight loss company a few years ago. They came to me and they said, we want to go after everyone who wants to lose weight. It's too big of a market. I can't find those people and I don't know their exact problem. So you have to figure out what are the traits of those people you're trying to get to, where do they hang out, what's going to compel them to purchase, and how can you motivate them to integrate with your product. There, it's a consistent principle across everything that you go after. This was one of my favorite campaigns um, that happened over the last few years. How many of you had an opportunity to buy a drink with your name on it? Only some of you. You guys got to get out and buy those drinks. So for the first time, so the reason this was so interesting to me is for the first time in 20, and the result was the first time in 20 years, software drink sales increased. So software drinks compete against water and energy drinks. Right? Those are really big markets. Right? But the software drink guys, and what, what Coca-Cola stumbled upon and had brilliant execution on, was this ability to say that I have, they found a way for their product to become part of stories of people's lives. Right? When they very first introduced this, which has maybe been three years ago now, all of a sudden the world transformed, and you see Coke and Diet Coke cans popping up in baby announcements and wedding proposals and all sorts of life events that propel the sell of the drink forward because they found a way for at one moment in time that drink to become a critical part of who you were and the story you wanted to tell. You think about that, 20 years, no increase in that market. And something that drove personalized experience and storytelling created a path for growth. That's really powerful in markets that are very stagnant. Right, and, and it just demonstrates that when you hit it right, you get an opportunity to create really interesting products um, that have a ton of value. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I believe in this whole idea of customer first. It is a specific mentality that you have to think about. It is always easier to think about features and functionality in the product than it is to think about who the actual customer is. But when you ground yourself in customer, then you actually build something people buy and has sustainable power versus just for the moment in time. And the companies that do this the best um, are recognize this. Now, obviously I worked at Disney, so you get a bunch of Disney examples too. Uh, has anyone been to Walt Disney World? And has anyone wore the Magic Band? Okay, so the Magic Band was, uh, um, and did you have a good experience with your Magic Bands? <laughs> so the Magic Band, for those of you who haven't been, <coughs> was really created around this idea of guest experience. 
Now at Disney, I learned the fastest way to kill a project was to say something that said, this might create guest dissatisfaction. Right? Because they care that when you're in the park, everyone has an amazing time. Just to highlight that, I had a, a friend, she was, used to be my nanny, and she took her little two-year-old boy to the park over Christmas. And they're in the park, right? It's his first journey there, right? You want this to be amazingly magical while you're in the park. They get into the ride, and like two hours in, he throws up everywhere. All over her and all over him. And they have like no change of clothes, right, in, the, in this story. And the Disney workers see this. And so imagine this moment in time, right? There's a choice here. If you're that parent, chances are you're like, okay, we got to leave the park and go clean up. And if you leave, do you think you're coming back? You're not coming back, right? And then there's this like mark on the day of exactly what happened. And so instead of that, she looks, er, sh the Disney workers see her and they go, hey, can we help you? And they end up going and helping her and her son get new clothes so and getting cleaned up so they can then stay in the park. And if you think about all of a sudden the culture change that happened for her, right? If she left, what would her memory have been? It was a wreck, right? Like, oh my gosh, it was so difficult. Can't believe this happened. And then after, you know, you have to get out of the park, all of those things. And what happens when all of a sudden the day magic, all that thing magically disappears and you're back in the park spending time with your family? Like that's powerful, right? And then not only does that happen, she becomes an advocate for getting more people in, right? She comes back and she tells the story, right? And she's and and most likely she now loves Disney forever because of that one moment in time, because they understood that it was customer first. And when they developed a magic band, it was a similar idea, which was how do we make it be that when people are in the parks, they focus just on the experience of, of making memories with their family. So people who go to Walt Disney World, it's most likely a once in a decade experience. People save for years to go to the park, to create a memory with their family, right? And when they go there, you want them to completely focus on the experience they have. So the magic band becomes a bracelet that you wear and you need nothing else in the park. It is your pass into the park. It is your fast pass. It is the way you can buy food. It is the way you buy merchandise. It is um, any, oh, your way to your photos. It is even the hotel key. That you literally can step out of your room if you're on resort with nothing else other than a magic band on your wrist and spend your entire day in the parks. Like that's really powerfully transformative. And it starts with a really big idea. If you think about how long it must take a company like Disney to implement infrastructure, it required changing everything in the park everywhere, right? How you go into every POS where you pay, how you go into the park, every hotel key in every, in every room that they have of thousands of rooms. But they didn't focus on that. They focused on what was the experience we're trying to create and how can that transform our relationship with our guest. <laughs> and by doing so, they created really interesting opportunities for their company. And so we might not live on the same magnitude of scale of a Disney, but we live as we develop products. And whether you're your own company or you work in a company, the way you develop products is the same. It is with this idea of customer first because we can, we can build and we can leverage that. I'm gonna skip, skip this one. Um, one of the other things I wanted to, you to think about is like you have to really understand how you create impact. Because it is this emotional side of, are we doing things that make a difference that people will want to use our product for? <coughs> Can you hear him? It's never about just one person.
so when I think about creating products, you know, I, I created some personalized merchandise lines, right? They didn't have the same impact of that. But I do often think about how what we're delivering can have an impact on people's lives, and the best products do those things. So Mick from Not Impossible Labs, right, he had this idea of how do you actually go help people make their own prosthetics. Children's prosthetics are very expensive. There's lots of amputees who live over in the Sudan. So they figured by taking this productized kit of services and training people that they could make a lasting impact. We live in a world today where companies who focus on social responsibility have, are having tremendous success. Because as a community, we really appreciate the opportunity to give back. We appreciate the opportunity to improve the lives of other people. And so as you develop companies and ideas, this idea that you can do so in a way that also creates greater good for our world is a really powerful trait. And it's something that people are looking for and that they're driving for and that you can be aware of from the very beginning. You know, even in my small 3D printing business, I watch lots of people come through who for them, it was life changing. Um, I had one, uh, one, one of my friends brought their brother through who has Down syndrome. And he says, we always tell him he's a superhero and he's exactly like all of us. And so he came through and he scanned him and he made him a superhero and he presented him that product. And he said, because I, because, and when this, ki when this kid came through, for him, it was the best thing he had ever done because he sees himself as a superhero every day and now, and then everyone else got to see himself as a superhero. We had people who were burn victims come through and for the first time, like see themselves, like they couldn't see themselves before. So even in our own little way, right, you get this opportunity to say, we are creating something that creates a powerful exchange for someone and that shows that we can serve other people well. And I think that's a really great part of what great products do, is they understand also that they're doing something good for people and that they're helping people in whatever that small or big aspect is. But you will see a very large trend in product development that is also directly related <coughs> to this idea of impact and social responsibility. Um, I think um, Davis might be coming through speaking too from Cotopaxi, and he's built his entire outdoor gear line based exactly on that principle of being able to give back and being able to help other communities um, when they're in need. And I think you're going to continue to see that, and I think it's a really great thing to remember as you are building product strategy. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted, um, I, so I, w I wanted to kind of summarize this into three ideas for you, and I think I'm close to out of time on my talk, so we'll, we'll run through these. Um, but I've given you some ideas. So this idea of it starts with the customer. This model is based on what we call design thinking. So typically people build stuff from the functional up, and what we want product development to do is come from the top down. We want it to be inspired by what customers care about first. And when you think about customers first, you can solve any problem. Because you can find a way, no matter what the technology is, to actually solve it in a really smart way. Don't focus on product or technology features. Focus on customer first and the problem you want to solve. And you can get really successful with that. Um, in our user experience bucket of customer first, we think about <coughs> things like blue sky thinking, um, we go deep on target markets. We think about customer journeys and user stories and then risks. And every time we follow this process, we get led to really interesting things. Um, we won't talk through the blue sky methodology, but there's this blue sky methodology that we also roll out in the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program that really is about how do you take very safe ideas and push them bigger and, and think about them at an even bigger scale. Companies like Disney actually have a blue sky team <coughs> whose entire job is to think about big ideas that can make a difference. Uh, but that's a really high level of some of those. <coughs> and then, sorry, losing my voice a little bit. The second idea we also, I want you to think about is this idea of frictionless experience. So one of the most critical parts in developing underneath those strategies is this idea that for the user there's no friction in the experience. They step into it or they grab your product and it just seamlessly works. Um, so as an example, how many of you, when you hit a website and a pop-up comes up, stay on that page? Nothing is more annoying, right? You just abandon. You're like, there's not enough value exchange in there. It was too difficult. Or think of the last app you downloaded on your phone where they asked you for so much information before you even got to the core of the app. What do you do? You stop, right? Users hate friction. So there's two things users are really bad at when developing. They don't like to think, and they're not going to spend any time. Now, I'm dead serious. Like, th you think about your own interactions. Next time you go download an app, you think about your process. Next time you see an ad and you think about clicking, like, what are you going through? 
anything that creates friction for the user adds to complexity and leads to abandonment. So the very best applications and products have figured out how friction is really, really low, how adoption is really easy, how you immediately can get to the thing that is of value before you actually <coughs> add it, all the information. I might not need 15 fields of information just to get you to use the app, right? All I need is something to get you in and demonstrate value, right? And so you've got to quickly get people through frictionless experiences or they will abandon and not use. The other recommendation, oh, I didn't throw it on these, but I'm going to throw it under this bucket, which is um, I call it frequency of use. Everyone develops products for when you have a million users. How many people have a million users on day one? No one. So you must develop for first customer acquisition, right? When you have no customers and someone has to come in and there's no community. See, it's really interesting to think about a community app when there is a community, meaning when there's lots of people who can exchange. In the early days of Facebook, we built an app on Facebook and we grew it to 80 million users when the API very first came out. We had 26 million monthly actives. And all of these same principles existed. We had to have frequency of use. Right? We had to recognize that you had to have adoption. In the very early days, Facebook knew that if you didn't have over 115 friends, you would abandon the platform and you wouldn't have enough content in your feed. So they built a whole strategy, an entire strategy, around getting you to 115 friends so that you had enough information to, tell th to create um, a draw for you to come back every day. So they understood this. This is very, very important. It has to be frictionless, and it also has to have high frequency of use. I once had some friends who were developing an app and they're like, see, once a million people are in here, it'll be perfect, right? But there's not a million people. So do not develop apps when there are no users. Develop their experience so they get value on day one so that they can then move forward. It's a really critical part of developing those. Um, and then this idea of what I call visualize and validate. One of the most important things you can do in developing products is before you go to market to get something visual that represents what that is and validate with the actual people who will give you money. Your friends and family do not count. They like you. They will tell you yes. They are not the actual market. The fastest way to figure out if you have a market big enough to take a product to is to get a bunch of those people who will look exactly the same and figure out what they will buy. We, I have a really specific methodology. I learned it from a guy who actually, his name's Frank Robinson. He invented the fail fast. He invented the Nellet Skelet model. Um, Frank has probably done 10,000 in-person customer interviews. Um, I had an opportunity to, to do hundreds of them with him. And what you learned from this process was when you get in the customer scenario and you talk to them about, you get information about them, the rule was always customers have to speak more than you, right? Your job is to not do the majority of talking. But we always take them, we always get some data from them around what we care about. We always talk them through problems. We show them what the product is. We tell them what the product is not, which is actually one of the most critical things. That there's lots of times where we think our product's really cool, but it's not gonna do these five things because we didn't have resources on day one. Your audience has to know that on day one. So we tell them what it's not, and then we ask them if they will buy, how many people will use it, and what they would be willing to pay or what the business model looks like. And if you do it right, you actually always get the answer. And then our ending questions are always twofold. One is, you walk out of this room, what are you gonna tell people you just saw? People will tell you that was your marketing message. Whatever you wanted people to think, that's what they saw. And then the second question we always ask is actually a baseball metaphor. So is this a triple, single, strikeout, home run? Most people get the baseball metaphor and they can tell you, which becomes what we call the buy as is. And then you can say, okay, and is there anything we could do to change that? How do we get it to a home run? They'll actually tell you and we call that the buy, the buy could be if, right? If we make a decision to go after those features and we grade all those customers and we put them in a table and we understand exactly what they look like. Now the model requires that you talk to people who look the same, right? It requires that I find at least 15 people who look exactly the same in the same market with the same characteristics that I'm going after and ask them the same questions. And when you do so, you know what you should build. If you don't do this product, you build something and typically you have some fixes to do. Could be major, could be minor. If you go talk to people before you build, you will know that what you build, peop if people will use it. I've pivoted major products by asking these exact questions. Products that we thought would make us millions of dollars that once the data came back said, you're gonna have to pivot in order to get to a market that's meaningful for the business model you need. And so when you're developing products, this becomes one of the most important things. 
You can build as many business cases as you want, but not until you get in front of people to know if they will actually buy your product will you know if you can successfully take it to market. And that becomes a really critical part of the overall life cycle of taking products to market. Um, and people don't spend enough time on this. It's the easiest thing to forget. I've got an idea, I keep running with it. Gotta get it to market sooner rather than later. <coughs> and it also will reduce the risk. Big companies are taking these models on. It's a new model for them too. Um, and if you're ever looking for resources, there's a couple of resources. There's a book called Nell at Scale. It's some professors out of BYU and Paul Alstrom helped to write that, which talks about this model. Um, and then it also dovetails into a book, some books around agile development. So if you're going after the tech space, you should read up on Scrum and agile development to make sure you're headed in those types of directions because they're really key to the overall product life cycles that we're trying to create. And visualization, just to be clear, can li look like a bunch of screenshots, right? There's these really cool tools in the market like Envision, Adobe just released one that let you make clickable prototypes for mobile apps without ever having to build anything. That's really cool, you should do that if you're thinking of the mobile space, but if you're thinking of physical worlds, there's companies like Shapeways who will 3D print any idea that you have. So if you have a physical product idea, go get it prototyped, go put it in the hands of people, see if they'll actually buy it way before you actually build stuff. And I know that if you start with this idea of going customer first, right, being centered in your story, creating ideas that have impact, and then being able to validate, you can take successful products to market. It's a model that's been repeated thousands of times, and the most successful companies follow methodologies like this because they understand how to rapidly iterate, get things out, and be grounded in their, in their customer along the way. And I just threw another example in there, and I threw my table of ranking people inside of there. Um, and so my, I guess my leap for you is like think big, right? I believe that when you think big and you have these ideas of innovation and creation, you can change the world. And if you follow ideas that are really core to how products are introduced to market today, you can take stuff to market quickly, you can get user adoption for it, and you can build really compelling things that I really believe will change the world. This is just an example of a project that launched in December. And I love the fact that this guy is thinking of IoT. He's like, how do I make a jacket, the bomber jacket that's got um, near field communication in it, it's got some QR codes. This jacket actually gives you access if you buy it to all the coolest parties in New York City um, and all of the experiences that come along with those kind of things. There's all sorts of innovation that people are doing and I think that you guys have the tools to be able to do them and you just have to jump in and go after them. Um, and if you have the right process, you, you can really hit things out of the park and create an amazing amount of success. So thank you for letting me come and talk about that and I think we're gonna open up for a few questions. Yep. Okay, here's your chance to ask some great questions. Who we got? This group always asks something. I can just go right here. <laughs> That's it's good. automatic. You need a starter group. So is there a difference between launching an app and launching a physical product to you? Mm, good question. I, so is there a difference between an app and a, um, a physical product? There's actually not much of a difference. Right now, the way you do acquisition strategies, right, and your, your marketing tactics might be somewhat different, your placement and your channels. But at the end of the day, both digital and physical products have the same adoption cycles. Um, the picture, there was an infinity loop on there. And what we know in customer journeys is no matter what product they're doing, they go through a process of awareness, considering, evaluation, purchase, um, usage, connecting, and advocacy. And it happens that it's true in every product. Okay, another question. Anybody? Um, where did you study and where, like, how did you get your start into where you are today? Oh, good question. So I went to BYU. I did my undergrad in computer science and I did my MBA. I actually did them both at BYU. Um, you know, when I, when I was in school, Everyone, the big companies were still doing all the recruiting. Our culture is much more moved to the entrepreneurial focus for a lot of kids coming out. Um, so when I, but when I came out of my computer science undergrad, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew that getting a computer science degree was gonna give me a bunch of opportunities. There were three women in my graduating class and I minored in dance. That's how I had to balance my <laughs> computer science. The, um, and so when I, I had no clue. So I decided that I would apply for every job in the career placement center and I would apply to grad school. So I did 100 job interviews when I came out of uh, my undergrad. 
because especially if you're a female in technology, you get a, you can interview with everyone. And so I talked to every comp I talked to everyone, and then I um, I had taken the GMAT and the GRE, and I applied to grad school. I had the unique opportunity when I was in college to work in the technology industry. So I was a software tester, and then I was over an IT distribution center for about 300 users deploying like infrastructure. So I kind of this unique opportunity to work in my field. When I came out, I knew a couple of things. I was never going to be a hardcore programmer, but I knew that I could think about how to build products and take them to market. So I ended up taking a job. Um, I ended up getting my acceptance to MBA school and an offer from a number of companies here locally. I'd kind of flown all over the country. Um, but when I got my offer, I said, do you know what? I'm going to go ask these guys if they'll work with my daytime MBA schedule. So I actually went to the daytime MBA program, 8 to noon, did our group study, noon to 5, and I worked 6 to midnight, 6 days a week for two years while I finished my uh, graduate program. And after that, I had an opportunity to go into the product management team. Um, and I, was in pr I ran one of the directory services product lines at Novell. At the time, we were competing head-on with Microsoft. And a couple, about three years into that, I was like, do you know what? I think I have this, this side where I want to move a little bit into startup land. So I jumped up over into companies, and I had really interesting opportunities. You know, I kind of have looked at my career as not necessarily about one job with a career, but about experiences where I can learn something, right, and new opportunities. When the Disney opportunity came along, I was coming off of a company, and my friend who was heading up Disney Research, we had worked for seven years before that together, he said, Sid, um, I have no idea where this is going. I don't even know exactly what this is going to look like, um, so I'm just telling you up front, but if you're interested, you can come have this job. So I was like, oh, that's, yeah, great. I have no idea what I'm stepping into, but I guess I'll go take it. So there's been a number of times where I've just taken the risk to say, I have no idea where this is leading, or even if this is a really great idea, but it sounds like I should go do it, and so I've jumped into it. That's how my Disney stuff came about. And it also came about because the CTO of the company where I was chief marketing officer, um, he became the head of the Disney Research Lab. And because we had such a great relationship, those opportunities were afforded. And I would tell you, every step I've had in my career is because of some relationship I've built in the past. Right? I might not be able to tell you today where I'm going to be a year from now. I can't. I actually can't tell you where I'll be a year from now. Right? You sell your company, you come off of that, and you're like, okay, well, I don't know what I should be doing. Um, but I do know that it will come because of the network that I've created and the opportunities they will grant me because of that. Um, so when you're uh, researching your, your product or even the market, are there certain tools that you use or would recommend to entrepreneurs in the class? Um, what tools on which side? Uh, want to research for the product and then want to research for the market. Um, so the mar my market research is heavily done with the target customer I'm going after. So I'll find them and I'll go talk to those people. Um, when I'm research markets, um, well, Google is my first best friend, but the places that I go to find out information, um, if you're looking for information on markets, so the U.S. Department of Labor has some of the very best free information about the majority of industries. A couple of months ago, someone wanted me to help validate a market around, it was the, um, think of Airbnbs, you know, the shared economy. This is creating a whole opportunity around cleaners, right? How do you find people to clean all of those? So because they're shared economy in the cleaning space. So we actually wanted to go figure out how many individual cleaners were in Orange County, right? And I found all that information on the Department of Labor through a bunch of really interesting reports. So there's lots of information. And, and industry-specific analysts have all sorts of great free reports and associations do, like nonprofit associations. Those are like my favorite places to go for free market research. Um, also, your local SBA offices will run reports for you if you take them stuff. They tend to give you more factual data that they're tracking, but they actually give you free reports if you go ask them. Thanks, over here. Along those same lines with market intelligence, uh, just kind of going off that, when do you feel confident enough that you should follow an idea, you should pursue it? When so, good question. When do you feel confident enough in an idea you should pursue it? Let me see if I go back a screen, oh, forward the other way. Um, so, without going into total detail, I track sophistication, relevance, by as is, and by could be if, and I grade companies on this. I have learned that once you talk to about 15 people who will look exactly the same, you have enough data that the rest of the data starts repeating itself. Sounds like a really small number, but you can test it yourself. You can talk to 30 people, and the data just starts to normalize after you talk, as long as you talk to the core number of people who look the same, right? If I talk to 10 people, and they're slightly different markets with slightly different demographics, they you know, live in different places, I can't reach them the same, they don't count, right? So when, like, when I wanted to go find cleaners in Orange County, I had to go find cleaners in Orange County. 
um, that looked exactly the same. And my number sits at 15. I've done way more interviews than that, but the data actually just normalizes after that many. And then I grade them. And if I get a chart that looks like this, I'm slightly concerned. Because what this chart tells me is that I have people who are pretty smart about this space. The relevance score is how important are they to my success in this market, right? Are they highly relevant? Do I need that customer to make success here? So if my sophistication and relevance are high and my buy as is is low, I sit in a troubling spot. And my buy could be if didn't get much better, right? So there was nothing I could really figure out when I was there that could tip them. Um, th things like this would make me pivot, it did make us pivot, actually, because we couldn't get enough data that took us in the direction we wanted. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I think we're out of time. Um, let's hear one more time for Steve.